So we're going to go straight on in with our first question. 65-year-old gentleman who dislikes engaging with healthcare presents now to his GP with a one-year history of progressive shortness of breath. On examination, his JVP was raised, fine crackles were heard on auscultation, and mild pitting edema was noted. He was referred to the local cardiologist, who noted a raised BNP level. A transthoracic echocardiogram shows an ejection fraction of 30%. Which of the following is the most likely underlying cause? A, anemia, B, thyrotoxicosis, C, ischemic heart disease, D, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, or E, constrictive pericarditis. Now you should see a poll on your screens and be able to answer that. I'll just give you the moment to answer that. Okay, so I can see most people there voted for C, 79% of you voted for C. Now we're going to continue on just with a further question before we go on to a bit of a tutorial on these couple of questions. And you're correct, the right answer is C, ischemic heart disease. So we'll just bash on with the second question. So a 65 year old man presents to his GP with worsening shortness of breath over a period of a few weeks. On examination, he has a raised JVP bilateral reduced air entry in both lungs and bilateral pitting edema. His blood test shows a haemoglobin of 65. He also has an echocardiogram and this shows an ejection fraction of 55% and he's not known to have any other medical history. Now which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's symptoms? A. Systolic heart failure. B. Diastolic heart failure. C. High output heart failure. C, pericarditis, or E, dilated cardiomyopathy. And again, the poll will pop up to give you guys some time to answer. Thanks guys, a bit of a more mixed result here. Now the correct answer is C, high output heart failure. And 45% of you got the correct answer there. You can just close that. So we'll first, we'll go over some definitions of heart failure. So cardiac or heart failure is defined as a cardiac output that's insufficient to meet the demands of the body. Now it can be subdivided into low and high output states. Low output cardiac failure is the more common subtype. This is characterized by a reduction in cardiac output that's unable to meet normal or increased demands. High output cardiac failure is more rare. This is a normal or even an increased cardiac output, but one that's still insufficient to meet the body's demands. 
Low output cardiac failure can be further subdivided into systolic and diastolic heart failure. Remember that systole is an active pumping phase of the cardiac cycle during which the ventricles contract and pump blood out of the heart. And diastole is the relaxation phase during which the ventricles fill with blood from the atria. Systolic heart failure is a failure of contraction, meaning that less blood is ejected out of the ventricles than normal. Hence, it is known as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. By far the most common cause of systolic heart failure is ischemic heart disease. So this is the disruption to the coronary circulation by atherosclerosis plus or minus infarction. Other causes of systolic heart failure include dilated cardiomyopathy. This is quite common and it involves a progressive enlargement of the ventricle, which results in poor contractility. Other causes are myocarditis, which causes inflammation of the heart muscle and infiltration of the heart muscle by some pathology, for example, sarcoidosis. Diastolic heart failure is a failure of relaxation, meaning that the ventricles do not fully relax to allow for normal filling during diastole. Here, the amount of blood ejected from the heart remains normal. Therefore, it is known as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The ventricles do naturally become stiffer with age, but the most common cause of diastolic heart failure is hypertension. This, increase, this creates an increased demand on the left ventricle, which leads to hypertrophy and reduced ability to relax and fill properly. Other causes include hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, or HOCAM. This is an inherited condition where the ventricular wall becomes hypertrophied and has a reduced ability to relax and fill properly. Other causes are restrictive cardiomyopathy, which is a rarer cardiomyopathy, which is ventricular filling. Cardiac tamponade. This is when fluid or blood accumulates in the pericardial space, leaving the, less, the heart less space to relax. And constrictive pericarditis. And this is where inflammation of the pericardium causes scarring and stiffening. High output cardiac failure. Now, like I said, that's rarer. Here we've got a normal or even an increased cardiac output, but one that is still insufficient to meet, meet the body's demands, even with maximal cardiac output. It's not well characterized by those typical heart failure symptoms. The causes can be remembered by two A's, two P's and two T's. So anemia, arteriovenous malformation. This results in shunting of blood, causing more blood to return to the heart via the venous circulation, requiring an increased cardiac output. Paget's disease. This is where there's increased bone remodeling, which incurs an increased energy demand. Pregnancy. In pregnancy, cardiac output increases by up to 60%. However, this is physiological and normal. Thyrotoxicosis. This is characterized by excessive activation of that sympathetic fight or flight mechanism. And thiamine deficiency. Severe thiamine deficiency causes a rare condition called beriberi, which affects the cardiovascular system. In all of these high output conditions, the heart initially compensates by increasing cardiac output. However, with increased demand, the heart eventually undergoes remodeling and decompensation, such that the heart cardiac output becomes decreased and it's not able to meet demands. So let's go back to this question. So here this man has symptoms and signs of heart failure, and this is confirmed as a diagnosis by his raised BNP. This gentleman has a low output systolic heart failure, confirmed by his reduced ejection fraction. Like I said in the previous slide, the most common cause of systolic heart failure is ischemic heart disease. So the answer here is C, ischemic heart disease. It's not likely to be anemia or thyrotoxicosis, as these are more likely to cause a high output cardiac failure. And it's not going to be at hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or constrictive pericarditis, as these are both causes of a diastolic heart failure, which would have a preserved ejection fraction. So if we return to the second question there, this man also has signs and symptoms of heart failure. However, this has come on over a few weeks. He has a preserved ejection, fra eject ejection fraction, so he doesn't have a systolic dysfunction. Therefore, he's, unable, he's unlikely to have a dilated cardiomyopathy, which causes a systolic dysfunction. With the finding of his profound anemia, his, anemia, his hemoglobin was only 65, he's likely to have a high output cardiac failure. So we'll go on ahead with the next question. I'm just going to bash on ahead with that. 
So a 65 year old gentleman with a six month history of anorexia and nausea. On examination, his JVP is raised and there is tender, smooth hepatomegaly and pitting edema. There's no ascites. The apex beat was not displaced and his lung very clear on auscultation. Which of the following diagnosis best fits the clinical picture? A, ischemic heart disease. B, systemic hypertension. C, aortic stenosis. D, mitral regurgitation or E, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And again, I'll give you a minute to answer that one. Great, thank you for that. So again, some mixed responses here in this one. So I think we weren't quite sure of the correct answer here. The single best answer here is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Now we're going to do another question and then we'll discuss these two questions. So a 65 year old female patient presents to the GP with a two month history of worsening shortness of breath, which is worse when she attempts to lie flat. She also reports occasionally waking up at night gasping for breath. She denies ankle swelling or weight gain. She has a past medical history of hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and a myocardial infarction two years ago. She also smokes 10 cigarettes per day. Which of the following clinical signs is most specific to left-sided heart failure? Pulses alternans, pulses paradoxus, a raised JVP, hypotension or hypoxia? And again, I'll give you a minute to answer that question. So again, a mixed response with most of you going for pulses alternans or pulses paradoxus. The single best answer here is pulses alternans. So we'll go ahead and talk a bit more about subdivision of heart failure. It can also be subdivided into right and left heart failure. Right heart failure causes blood to back up into the peripheral circulation known as venous congestion. Therefore, the symptoms are of excess fluid in the periphery. Patients might complain of ankle swelling, weight gain, abdominal distension, and anorexia or nausea. On examination, you might find a raised JVP, pitting ankle or sacral edema, a tender smooth hepatomegaly, ascites, and perhaps evidence of pleural effusions. Left heart failure causes blood to back up into the lungs, known as pulmonary congestion. 
Therefore, symptoms are, are predominantly respiratory. Patients might complain of feeling short of breath, particularly at night and when lying flat. They may also complain of a nocturnal cough and perhaps with pink frothy sputum. On examination, you might find the patient to be tachypneic with bibasal fine crackles on auscultation. As the left side of the heart is responsible for plump, pumping blood to the rest of the body, there might also be signs of systemic hypoperfusion, such as cyanosis, a prolonged capillary refill time, or hypotension. So if we go back to these two questions, so the single best answer here was COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This man's got several signs of a right-sided heart failure. He's got a raised JVP, he's got hepatomegaly, he's got anorexia, and he's got pitting edema. Any mention of heart failure, mention of dyspnea, his lungs are clear. The most likely cause of this man's right-sided heart failure, therefore, is COPD. Chronic COPD leads to pulmonary hypertension. So that means there's an increased resistance of the pulmonary vasculature. Therefore, the right ventricle fails to cope with this increased pressure, causing systemic venous congestion and the symptoms noted where blood is backing up into the peripheral circulation. Ischemic heart disease and hypertension are both common causes of a left-sided failure. And the aortic and mitral valves are also part of the left side of the heart. Therefore, aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation also puts it additional stress on the left side of the heart, showing, causing a left-sided picture. Looking at the second question there, um, the single best answer here is pulses alternans. This lady has several signs of a left-sided heart failure. She's got shortness of breath. She's got paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, which is where she wakes up at night gasping for breath. And she has um, shortness of breath that's worse on attempting to lie flat, which is called orthopnea. She denies any symptoms of right-sided heart failure. She's got no peripheral symptoms such as ankle swelling or weight gain. She's also got several risk factors for a left-sided heart failure. She's hypertensive, she's got ischemic heart disease, she's got high cholesterol and she's a smoker. Pulses alternans. Now that's an alternating strong and weak pulse and this is almost always indicative of left ventricular impairment and actually to have that finding carries a poor prognosis. To go through the other answers with you, pulses paradoxus. Now that's the phenomenon of an abnormally large fall in systolic blood pressure during inspiration. Normally there's a slight fall in systolic blood pressure when you breathe in, just due to the increased systolic pressure. However, it doesn't normally exceed 10 millimetres of mercury. And as we've gone through in the previous slides, a raised JVP is a sign of right-sided heart failure. Hypotension can occur in heart failure as the heart becomes decompensated but it's not a specific sign of um, left-sided heart failure. It can occur in many things. And hypoxia can occur in left-sided heart failure if the lungs are very congested. But hypoxia in itself is not specific to left-sided heart failure and can occur due to many causes. For example, COPD, pneumonia, pulmonary embolism. So the question here is asking the most specific sign. So we'll move on to the next question. A 68-year-old man has increasing shortness of breath over the past three months. He says this is worsened to the point where he's unable to walk more than 10 metres without having to stop for a rest. He sleeps with three pillows. On examination, he's comfortable at rest, but he becomes short of breath while undressing and transferring to the examination couch. Examination reveals pedal edema bilaterally to the mid-shins and bilateral basal lung crepitations. Which of the following is the best description of his shortness of breath? A, NYHA class 1, B, class 2, C, class 3, D, class 4, or E, class 5? Again, I'll get to that question.
So you guys know your class as well. Uh, most of you answered correctly, and the correct answer was NYHA class three. Well done. Now NYHA stands for the New York Heart Association. And this is a classification of heart failure based on severity of symptoms. And it's actually quite useful to use as it carries a, a prognosis with it, demonstrated as a one year survival percentage. So as you can see in the table here, class one is characterized by no limitation in physical activity. And activity doesn't cause any undue fatigue, palpation, dyspnea. And the prognosis normal, 95% of these patients are alive at a year. Class two is characterized by being completely comfortable at rest, but a slight limitation in physical activity with normal activity causing dyspnea or fatigue. And that carries a prognosis of 85% at a year. Class three is characterized by comfort at rest, but a marked limitation in physical activity with even minimal activity causing fatigue or dyspnea. And that carries again, the same prognosis of class two at 85%. Class four is characterized by dyspnea or discomfort even at rest with an inability to carry out any physical activity without marked discomfort. And as you can see, that carries really quite a poor prognosis with only 35% of those patients being alive at a year. So going back to the question there, it's quite clear that this man is having breathlessness after walking 10 meters, but he remains comfortable at rest. Like, you, like it said in the question, he gets breathless just, just getting onto the examination couch. So he's more a class three than a class two, which carries a one-year survival of around 85%. So moving on to the next question. A 65-year-old male patient presents to the general practitioner with a two-month history of shortness of breath on exertion. He's also noticed a few episodes of waking up at night gasping for breath. His panel history is significant infarction two years ago. On physical examination, the jugular being elevated three centimetres above normal and there's pitting edema to the mid shins. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in his management? A, urgent referral for a transesophageal echocardiogram. B, urgent referral for a transthoracic echocardiogram. C, measure B-type natriuretic peptide or BNP and refer for transthoracic echocardiogram if elevated. D, non-urgent referral for transthoracic echocardiogram. Or E, initiate management with lisinopril, corvedilol and furosemide. Great. So most of you have got the correct answer there. That was uh, that was C. So measure the BNP level and refer for transthoracic echocardiogram if this is elevated. So let's talk a bit about investigations of heart failure. Um, I'm just going to talk about these nice guidelines. So these nice guidelines are aimed at primary care physicians such as GPs who come across patients with symptoms or signs of heart failure. Taking a careful history is important in these patients and it also the importance of performing a clinical examination. So you must listen to the heart and the lungs, you must take vital signs such as blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen saturations and look for signs of heart failure. So look for peripheral edema, look for ascites. Initial investigations include an ECG and you're looking to see if there's any evidence of having had a cardiac event or if there's any arrhythmogenic cardio, um, pathology there. Uh, perform routine bloods, so full blood count, liver function, glucose, fasting lipids, thyroid function, and to perform a chest x-ray. 
Now the guidelines, the NICE guidelines specify to check the B-type natriuretic peptide, or BNP for short. This is a substance produced by the ventricles in response to an increased mechanical load and wall, pretty specific for heart failure. If this result is elevated, and the NICE guidelines define this as greater than 400 nanograms per litre, the patient should be referred for a transthoracic echocardiogram within six weeks. And the echocardiogram is looking to assess the structure of the heart, look at the valves, and assess the function, in particular the ejection fraction. And this will guide further investigation and management. I've put angiograms there in brackets. So if, someone had, if someone's ECG looked like they'd had a cardiac event and had some sort of coronary vessel disease, you would probably want to consider an angiogram. Now, chest x-ray findings in heart failure are a common exam question. And these can be the name as ABE, convenient. So A stands for alveolar edema, and this is due to pulmonary congestion, and it appears as a symmetrical, fluffy white patchiness radiating from the hilar regions in a sort of bat's wing pattern. You can see that quite well in this x-ray that's up on the slide just now, just sort of that fluffiness, and that's just pulmonary congestion, so that's fluid sitting in the lungs. B stands for curly B lines, and this is fluid sitting between the um, periphery of the lungs, so between the alveoli themselves. I'm not convinced you can really see curly B lines on this chest x-ray, but they do appear as sort of horizontal lines around the edges of the lung, and that indicates fluid in the interstitial spaces. C stands for cardiomegaly. So cardiomegaly is when the heart takes up more than 50% of the thoracic diameter. This is actually more reliably measured on a PA film. This is an AP film. So a film taken from the back, it's easier to like, delineate the heart size from that. D stands for dilated prominent upper load vessels. This occurs again due to pulmonary venous hypertension. And E is for eff effusion. So again, due to left-sided heart failure and pulmonary congestion, effusions can appear. So if we go back to check that question, the correct answer there was C to measure the BNP and refer for transthoracic echocardiogram if elevated. So that's a pair, a pair of the NICE guidelines. BNP is the first investigation to order. If the BNP is not elevated, this essentially excludes a diagnosis of heart failure. He doesn't need a referral straight to echo prior to checking the BNP. It's also important to know this man's heart structure and function prior to initiating management. In particular, you wouldn't start all these medications mentioned in option E at the same time. All of these medications have a side effect of hypotension. And if you start all of those at once, you would probably feel quite unwell. Um, also, you must check renal function prior to starting anything like alicinopril. So we'll move on to the next question. Um, a 72-year-old man presents with gradually worsening shortness of breath over the past six months to the point where he's breathless on mild exertion and is only able to sleep with three pillows. On examination, he's comfortable with no pedal edema and a clear chest. He becomes easily breathless when transferring to the examination bed. His pulse rate is 65 and regular. Pressure is 132 over 85. An echocardiogram demonstrates an ejection fraction of 30%. He's already been started on Ramapil and Bisopril by his GP. Which of the following drugs is the single most appropriate next addition to his treatment plan? A. Digoxin. B. Spironolactone. C. Diltiazem. D. Bumetanide. Or E. Hydralazine. And again, I'll give you a moment to answer that.
So I can see most of you voted there for B, spironolactone, and that is indeed the single best answer. So let's talk about the management of chronic heart failure. So first off, it's always lifestyle modification. Things such as stopping smoking, losing weight if they're overweight, improving diet are all sensible suggestions. Control of blood pressure, glucose levels and cholesterol are also important as these are all risk factors for heart disease. Specific to heart failure, there is evidence that a low salt diet and fluid restriction improves mortality. In terms of medications, all patients with a diagnosis of heart failure should be offered an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. So that's an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker. They're not usually started at the same time because they both have a risk of hypotension and ACE inhibitors need to be titrated carefully up to the maximum dose over a number of weeks or months. Both of these drugs have good evidence to improve mortality. Looks such as furosemide or bumetanide improve symptoms. They don't have any effect on mortality, but they do improve quality of life. If symptoms persist and the patient is a New York Heart Association class three or four, consider addition of an aldosterone antagonist. So this is things like spironolactone or a plerinone. Ivabradine is recommended for those that are class three or four with a reduced ejection fraction who are confirmed to be in sinus rhythm. These are usually started under the care of a cardiologist. Hydralazine can be used if, those, if patients are intolerant of ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. Again, this would probably be done under consultant cardiology care rather than in general practice. So if these treatments don't control symptoms, the patient might be considered for cardiac resynchronization therapy or an implantable cardiac device. You probably don't need to purposes, but it is good to know that other things can be done beyond medication. These are sort of a last resort and this decision again made by a cardiologist. The use of digoxin, this is indicated in patients with atrial fibrillation and heart failure with an aim to restore their heart to a more normal rhythm. Digoxin actually worsens mortality, but it improves morbidity. It's useful to know common adverse effects of drugs used in heart failure. And again, this is a common exam question. So we'll just run through some of these common drugs that are used and what their side effects are. So beta blockers. So these are blocking the sympathetic activation of the heart. So they will reduce the heart rate and they will reduce the blood pressure. Therefore, adverse effects are bradycardia, hypotension and dizziness. ACE inhibitors, these function to promote salt excretion. So again, these can cause hypotension. They can also mess with the salt balance, causing hyperkalemia. As they work via the kidney, kidney injury can also occur. Hence why these are started at a low dose and slowly titrated up to maximum tolerance. A very common side effect of ACE inhibitors, which occurs in up to 35% of patients, is a dry cough. The mechanism is multifactorial, but if this cough is troublesome, an alternative drug is indicated. ACE inhibitors can also cause things like angioedema, swelling of the face, and gastrointestinal upset. Spironolactone again works by promotion of salt excretion, so it can mess with the kidney function and salt balance. Of particular note, spironolactone has the odd side effect of producing gynecomastia or breast tenderness and changes in libido. It's actually used as part of hormone replacement therapy for transgender women exactly for this reason. Furosemide again promotes water excretion and therefore has the obvious side effects of hypotension and salt imbalance and acute kidney injury. Hydralazine is associated with headache, palpitations and flushing and digoxin can cause dizziness, blurred vision and gastrointestinal upset. So looking back at this question, we can see the single best answer is spironolac. He's got a diagnosis of heart with a reduced ejection fraction, and he's rightly been commenced on ACE inhibitor, ramipril, and a beta blocker, bisoprolol. Now, if this man was particularly troubled by peripheral, peripheral edema, it would be kind to offer him a diuretic, but he doesn't, he doesn't seem to have any pedal edema and he's got a clear chest. Um, he's also categorized as class three, so as we saw in the previous slide, the next step in his management is a addition of an aldosterone antagonist such as spironolactone. Digoxin is not indicated here because he's in sinus rhythm. There's no reason to give him digoxin. And hydralazine and diltiazem are reserved for patients that remain uncontrolled despite initial management. So we go for the spironolactone first. 
So a 77-year-old female presents to hospital with left leg redness and pain. She's diagnosed with cellulitis and given intravenous fluids and oral, oral fluid cloxacillin. She's got a background of asthma, ischemic heart disease and heart failure. The next day she complains of feeling short of breath. On auscultation you can hear bilateral crackles. Observations show that she's tachycardic and saturating at 93% on room air. ECG shows a sinus tachycardia. What is the next best step in the management of this patient? A. Glycerol trinitrate. B. Frusamide bolus. C. Morphine. D. Fumetanide. Or E. Bisoprolol. Great, most of you got that one correct. The single best answer there was B, a furosemide bolus. So let's talk a bit about acute heart failure. So acute heart failure is signs and symptoms of heart failure, but occurring within minutes or hours. These patients become rapidly unwell and can look peri-arrest really quite quickly. There's various precipitants of acute heart failure, myocardial infarction, acute kidney injury, fluid overload, infection, pulmonary edema, among others. Anyone that's unwell can dip into acute heart failure. Acute fail heart failure can progress rapidly, so management is often initiated before the underlying cause is known. The patient will likely look unwell, be tachypneic and anxious. There might be a frothy pink sputum present. On auscultation, you might hear wheeze or crackles throughout the chest, and this is a sign of pulmonary edema. Initial management is to set the patient upright and administer high flow oxygen. IV access should be obtained and a bolus of intravenous furosemide given. This causes a rapid diuresis and fluid loss. Morphine can be given as an anti-anxiety medication. However, please be cautious as this can produce respiratory depression. Blood should be taken, including troponin, chest x-ray should be taken, arterial blood gases and ECG. Ongoing management aims to produce a negative fluid balance and this should be closely monitored with daily fluid balance, daily weights and monitoring kidney function. These patients can become very sick very fast, so it's sensible to involve a senior plus or minus critical care at an early stage if you think this patient's deteriorating. In critical care, patients can be placed on continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP. This is by way of a tight fitting mask that provides a constant pressure to the nose and mouth. This aims to provide enough additional pressure to the alveoli to push the fluid out. Patients might also require intubation and mechanical ventilation. In the ITU setting, patients can have various infusions of diuretics such as furosemide. An intraortic balloon pump, this is really a last resort for these patients that have, that have progressed to cardiogenic shock and that would only be done in an ITU setting. If the patient's got kidney injury, they might require dialysis or ultrafiltration to remove that fluid. So looking back at the question, the single best answer is furosemide bowl. And she can fully reserve care setting as not first line. Morphine, as I said, can be used as an anti-anxiety drug to stop the patient from hyperventilating quite so much. But again, it's the first thing you'd read. Fumetanide is a tick, but furosemide works much faster. Resoprolol, that's a blocker. That's not going to help us. So now that I've scared you with acute heart failure, let's try a wee scenario and we can all play doctor. So a 75 year old woman with dementia, hypertension and diabetes is admitted with worsening blood sugar control. 
You're called to see her after she develops worsening shortness of breath. On examination, she's tachypneic and there's frothy sputum around her mouth. You note bi-basal crepitations and bipedal edema. Observations show saturations of 85% on 15 litres, heart rate of 110, blood pressure of 95 over 70, respiratory rate of 28 and temperature of 37.1. She's known to have difficult IV access and you're not able to cannulate her after three attempts. Her escalation plan indicates that she's not for any treatment beyond ward-based care and she's not for resuscitation. Which of the following is the next step in the management of this patient? A, keep trying to cannulate her to give her the IV fluid. B, call the resuscitation team or the crash team. C, give oral furosemide. D, start CPAP. Or E, catheterize. I'll give you a moment to answer that. Great, so some mixed responses here. Most of you actually saying start CPAP. A few of you saying oral Um, A few of you saying call the crash team and a couple of people want to keep cannulating and one person wants to catheterize. Fine. So the correct single best answer is to call the resuscitation team or the crash team. In this scenario, this lady is unwell. She's displaying signs of acute heart failure. It's not clear if it's her cellulitis, cellulitis that has pre precipitated this or she's had some cardiac event or something else, but you know that she needs IV furosemide to offload this fluid in her lungs. You've had three attempts at cannulation. Oral furosemide is slow acting and you need something rapid. Fortunately, this lady's got an escalation plan, plan in place to keep her at ward level care. So she's unlikely to be a candidate for CPAP. We usually give CPAP in an ITU setting. You know that you need to monitor her urine output, so a catheter is a sensible thing to think about, but a catheter is not going to help her right now. As a junior doctor, you're often the first person to come to these sick patients, and it's up to you to decide what you can do on your own and when you need help. It's also worth bearing in mind that most hospitals' crash team or resuscitation team isn't just for cardiac arrests, but it's for getting rapid senior help for any deteriorating patient. So you can still call the crash team for sick patients, even if they're only for ward level care and even if they have a DNAR in place. In this case, there's a reversible cause of this woman's breathlessness. And if she can get IV access and get some IV furosemide, she might be just fine. Also, cannulas are hard and sweaty, panicking, hypodensive old ladies with dementia. So I think that's us reached the end of the tutorial. I was just going to pop up.